Hello there, and welcome back to the Senate Podcast. We're on episode number 13. I'm your host, Caleb Johnston, and today I'm joined by not one, but two other misfits. And here's the thing. Which one am I going to introduce first? So I'm going to introduce the man, the myth, the legend himself, Mr. Andrew Tate Smith. Uh-oh. Here so I am, Beck. <laughs> you're back. But what does that mean? Are, are you... I think we're getting the worst out of the way. It's like, yeah, here, okay. we're going to get through yeah. this pile of garbage. Um, we're going to set this to the side, and we just kind of have to sift through before we get to the good stuff. The worst is out of the way. Yes, thank God. Now we can introduce the man himself, Tony, the multiverse traveling Vandal Savage himself, Quinn. How you doing? Oh, man, well, I'll tell you what, we're in the middle of this massive crisis right now. Universes are folding. The uh, Inhumans universe is trying to come back into existence, but we're not trying to let that happen because, like, three people watched that show and it bombed. But I've managed to find a refuge uh, in the Speed Force, <laughs> and so I can record this podcast. Dude, that was so how funny. how much time I have until the war starts again, but, you know. That's just how when it goes. You, when you said Vandal Savage, that was hilarious. <laughs> you're you're going to be the, the Vandal Savage of this podcast. <laughs> Somehow surviving every uh, every crisis. <laughs> All right, so I'm bringing both you guys in today because we have a very interesting episode planned out. It's all about publishers and developers. So essentially, I stole this idea from a podcast. It's just a fun exercise. I listened to a, um, a PlayStation podcast. So this was on Sacred Symbols Plus. They did an exercise where each, they had actually five of them. So we have three, where we create our own publisher. We were going to go through and basically draft game studios for our publisher based on kind of what we want, the what we want to create um, as in indie games or shooters or, you know, RPGs. Or maybe our publisher wants to be a little bit of everything. We're going to get into that. We put ourselves in a number generator. We're going to go down the. We're going to go down the list with starting with Andy, uh, then myself, and then Tony. So this will probably take up most of the episode. Uh, we're going to start with this, and then at the end, we're just going to talk developers um, because this exercise is really about like understanding the games industry more in depth. So let's kick it off with Andrew Tate. <laughs> What's before you give me your pick? Uh, explain a little bit about your studio and what you want to accomplish with it. All right. Um. So that's actually a very good question. The thing I wanted my studio to kind of focus on is core gameplay, and I know that kind of means a lot for different people. But I'm really into roguelites, but at the same time, I like games that have a lot to offer within the games that you play. So a lot of the stuff I have takes inspiration from games that have value and provide more than just one playthrough, so to speak. I like it. What's the name? Did you come up with a name? Um, I mean, I come kind of, not necessarily, but off the top of my head, I was thinking of something like the Simple Games, you know, like the Simple Games Studio, something like that. Okay, I like that. It's, um, it's, it's, it's simple. Yeah. And the, it, it does, it's anything but simple, Yeah, but you know, it's kind of one of those things that you would see on like a title card for, you know, like a trailer of oh, a simple game studio. I like that a lot. Okay. So yeah, that's your publisher. Yeah. We're going to go with that. You're going to foster uh, studios basically for core gameplay, um, and mechanics and the feel. Mm -hmm. All right. What's your first pick? All right. So this first one is called. Dear Villagers, and this one actually has a variety of games under its belt. I mean, there's one in particular why I picked it, but to go off the list here, some of the stuff they made is a game called The Forgotten City, which is a time-based detective game at Ancient Rome. You have Revita, which is a side-scrolling twin-stick roguelite platformer. Scourgebringer, a fast-paced, free-moving roguelite platformer. I mean, that's a little bit of a pattern here, but they do also have games like Impulsion, which is a first-person parkour-based uh, FPS. 
And I guess to gloss over the overall theme here, um, Dear Villagers has a lot of different concepts. And there are games on here such as, I mean, just pulling up the list right now, the Away, Journey to the Unexpected. Basically, just the game can make different characters come to life. And I want this one to give you an atmosphere of uh, versatility and maybe IPs that might catch the audience's attention as they pick it up for the first time. That's interesting. So Dear Villagers, that's an indie um, developer. Yeah. Okay, so um, this is some. This is a, a, a studio that a lot of people may not have heard of. I've never heard of this studio. Mm. Um, but what's interesting is I'm sure they have created a lot of uh, PC games or, you know, games that pop off on Steam, right? Yeah, I mean, I think there might be some on Xbox. I'm not 100% okay. sure, but definitely Steam as, like, the primary um, company. Well, I guess the company game platform. I think, platform I think it's always, in, yeah, I think it's interesting when um, teams like that that create hits on, on Steam or just those style of games when mm -hmm. they become popular and then um, move to console. Yeah, even if the Steam Deck has been a system that's been recently manifested to allow people an opportunity to play Steam games without mm -hmm. necessarily investing in a high-end computer. I like it. Good pick. So, we'll move on to mine. And let me start with the name of my publisher. My publisher's name is called Polaris. And the reason it's called Polaris is it kind of ties directly into my first pick. It is Polaris in, in real life is, is the galaxy that is the North Star. And it kind of this, this studio, um, well, this publisher that, that I'm creating is all about narrative. It's about um, either narrative third person or first person games or platformers, but it's all designed around having a strong narrative um, focus and feel to it. My first pick, and then I'll explain a little bit more, will be Insomniac Games. Mostly because Insomniac Games is one of my favorite game studios. And also, I think it's probably the best game studio in the industry. But the reason I picked Insomniac is for Ratchet and Clank. Yes, they have Spider-Man. They're coming out with Wolverine. But... Ratchet and Clank, to me, is one of my favorite series ever. And it's a, it's a super fun, you know, third-person action platformer. And the narrative they've created with Ratchet and Clank has been going on, you know, has been consistent for almost, for what, over two decades now. So, you know, Polaris is just a play on... Um, you know, some of the games are actually set in the in the galaxy of Polaris inside of the Ratchet and Clank universe. <laughs> so I was like, okay, a publisher with that um, focused around games like this, it makes sense. I'll be picking um, a lot of my picks will have a lot of sentimental value, you know, for me because I love these type of games, these narrative action games. And yeah, that's my first pick. So we have. Um, Dear Villagers and Insomniac. So we're moving on to the third pick, which will be Mr. Savage. All right. Well, uh, my publisher is called Scrooge Interactive, and we just want to make money. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> now, the name of my publisher is Weirdo Interactive, which obviously the name Weirdo in it sounds pretty strange, right? But... I've always been kind of a weird guy. You know, I've been accused of being weird. I accuse myself of being weird. Um, and I'm kind of a weird gamer as well. Like, I, there are a few, like, high-profile games releasing, you know, later this year and every year that I look forward to. You know, Kingdom Hearts 4, Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth, Final Fantasy 16, all that stuff looks great. 
but usually and like i joke around about this uh with caleb and andy sometimes like when like e3 rolls around or some kind of uh new game showcase most of the games i'm excited for are those little indie games that a lot of like more quote-unquote mainstream gamers look at and they're like what what okay that uh okay that's interesting you know like i and i equate it to because being a weirdo has a stigma of like those people you know that you went to school with or that you work with that like get overlooked you know like people look at them and immediately judge them you know like oh you know they don't have these qualifications so i'm not gonna hang out with them you know so i want my publisher to be a home for people's ideas that wouldn't get attention from you know like a big studio you know like it's mainly for the people who maybe feel like me like they don't quite have a home in the realm of gaming you know so they can play the games made by my studio and you know we'd embrace anything no matter how strange no matter how small you know so that uh that's kind of my thesis and then for my first developer pick um i'm actually gonna go pretty small to start out with i'm gonna go with fiction factory games um and they've made so far they've only made the two visual novel slash um dating simulators arcade spirits and arcade spirits the new challengers but man i you know face some tragedy in my personal life last year and i checked out the first game on a whim because i was looking for visual novels that are also on switch because that's where i like to play them and you know i read about this one i'm like oh that sounds fun so i i i started playing it and was immediately struck by the characters you know the atmosphere it's just you know like a really fun just a really chill vibe and then the second game uh kind of hit me emotionally and kind of taught me some stuff about life. And that's always what I love from a good video gaming experience. Um, so I would, I think a great place to start in the industry is doing something small and visual novels, you know, are pretty easy to make in comparison to other stuff. And um, one thing that I would want to do is like, make at least some of mine available on phones and other mobile devices because not everyone has a game console you know but everyone has a phone so i think that'd be a cool way to get people into playing games you know like if they play one of my games on their phone and they like the story and they see that i'm releasing something on a console then they'll be like oh i'm gonna buy a console because i like this publisher you know i like what they put out so um yeah i like that pick um I was thinking, you know, it's funny you said that. Are we going to pick studios that are mobile uh, game developers or some a studio that's a, a VR game developer? So, you know, you're branching out like that. You know, that's um, your publisher is now um, going to be, you know, a little bit more diverse than others. Yeah, you know well, what I mean? one thing I noticed recently is that the ios store has a lot of visual novels you know and i was like because that's a genre that i used to kind of make fun of like oh i'm not playing a visual novel what you just scroll through text but like a lot of them can actually have like interactive elements to them you know so i figure you know why not combine those two things like you know like it doesn't have to be specifically on a console it could be like just a way to reach you know just the quote-unquote normies yeah i agree <laughs> and um that's you know insomniac they have their um hands in a lot of different you know um projects like that with vr too so that was one reason i did want them there um very uh multifaceted like that so i think that's a great pick uh, f- uh fiction factory games yeah all right oh, we're and through wait. the first round oh, i'm sorry yeah, go ahead. No, um, I uh, last year I made a YouTube video talking about these games, and the 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 lady who was the character designer who works at this studio actually uh, saw my video and she commented on it, you know, thanking me for 
saying nice things about the game and stuff. And that she was going to share the video with the rest of her team because they love hearing people talk about the game. So, I mean, I've already interacted with somebody from the studio and presumably more know who I am. So, I mean, I mean, you know, you know. So you're turning this exercise into the real life. Uh, it could happen. Real life. Um, it, it could happen. <laughs> they you got never my know. number. <laughs> yeah. So we're through the first round, and I I like the uh, I like the ideas of our publishers. So let's flesh it out a little bit more. So second pick, we'll move on to Andy. All right. Now I know Tony talked a little bit about normies, and I feel like this <laughs> publisher up next kind of hits that particular stride and that's going to be riot games i love it now before you just say oh league of legends there are a few games that they've made underneath the right name i guess under the moniker riot forge that has branched off into I guess different genre games that try and fill that universe in its you know essence uh one example is the Ruined King. It's basically like a, a a side story. It's an RPG turn-based that takes place with some of the characters. Hextech Mayhem is kind of like a parody of what do you want to call it? 8-Bit Runner. And then you have Convergence. And these are all under the League of Legends IP but they take that IP and they do different elements to appease to different, you know, audiences by using the same universe. Um, even Legends of Runeterra, it's, it's just a card game, but it just takes everything that you know about the original MOBA and fleshes it out in a different lens for different people to appreciate. And I would pick this one because it was able to do that it was able to take something that most people kind of just roll their eyes at and then gives it an opportunity for someone else to go and say hey you know i'm not a big fan of this game but this other game that kind of sheds a different light isn't so bad so i might pick it up and give it a shot i think that sounds nothing wrong with that I think that sounds like a great idea andy and it's never something i really thought about but like a lot of streamers only play online multiplayer games, you know, like C- C- Call of Duty, Overwatch, Apex. So, like, if you got into that space and made something that was more creative than those kind of games that, mm-hmm. you know, kind of become meme, like, oh, every Call of Duty game is basically the same. Then, like, streamers who are streaming your game and stream your game pretty exclusively would be showing people like a new side to that genre and like what it could be and you know maybe show yeah. like it doesn't have to just be this thing that it is now like it could be so much more i mean it really depends on the demographic too the, the biggest thing is that it really depends on the game itself if you have something that's um multiplayer is usually going to have a recurring you know, set of streamers and demographic that it kind of shifts focus on to. But I do like the ability to provide other options should someone decide, I think there's more to it than just this. And I think League is just the big flag game aside from the other side projects. And I just like the concept of providing one main game maybe, but just maybe branching that out into other opportunities. Yeah, I like it. Um, you're showcasing uh, their, you know, their talents aside from what they're known for. Exactly. Yep. It's it's simple. Yeah, the simple game. Simple. <laughs> I love it. All right, great second pick. All right, games. All right, we'll move on to Polaris for my second pick. My second pick will be Sucker Punch. Ooh. Now Ooh. I love. Love Sucker Punch. My my top two studios, I go back and forth between which are my favorite, of course, Insomniac and Sucker Punch. Sucker Punch, they're known for Rocket Robot on Wheels, Sly Cooper, Infamous, and Ghost of Tsushima. Of course, they perfectly fit into my publisher with the narrative, um, narrative games, whether it's the third-person 
um, action games, third person stealth games, uh, platformers, any of that. One thing I love about Sucker Punch are the stories they create. So essentially, I would like to bring Sucker Punch on to continue the Ghost of Tsushima IP. I wouldn't have them back for Sly Cooper. I wouldn't have them back for uh, Infamous. I would like to see them branch off um, and evolve from what they're doing now and give them, you know, a lot of uh, freedom to go forward with what they're doing and not necessarily go back um, and recreate, you know, things that they're they're known for. And I think that's also what um, PlayStation is allowing them to do now with uh, what they're doing with Ghost of Tsushima and their future projects. So I, I want to see more of that from them. And that perfectly fits into into my publisher. And for, you know, games they're known for and games we all love, like, you know, the Sly Cooper games or the Ratchet and Clank games and, and games like that, I have, a, I have a, um, an idea for that later on down my list. But for now, I want to see them continue, you know, evolving off of what they're doing now. That's it. So yeah, solid pick. Solid pick at Sucker Punch. Love, I love that team. All right, moving on to Tony. Go ahead with your second pick. You know, I never put it together in my head that they made Sly and Ghost of Tsushima and yes. Infamous. Like they, they're clearly showing their range yes. as the developers. So I think they could do pretty much anything. So that's a great pick. Um. My next pick, getting into actual games, you know, if you don't like visual novels, um, is Swedish developer Simogo. I might be saying that wrong. S I M O G O. Uh, they've made the only thing I've played from them is uh this rhythm game, uh like a rhythm action game called Sayonara Wild Hearts. Um, How do I explain this game? It's a rhythm game, but the visuals are like kind of something out of Scott Pilgrim. Like there's a loose story happening uh, that I think you can interpret however you want. It's one of those like artsy type of things. And rhythm games have always been kind of a blind spot for me. I played Guitar Hero one and two when i was younger a lot but beyond that it's never been something that i ever really dabbled in but dude if you ever want like just a pure concentrated shot of serotonin play cyan cyanar wild hearts the soundtrack is incredible it looks very interesting the visuals the gameplay it's a little tough in some areas if you're rhythmically challenged like i am but dude um I would uh I was listening to a podcast recently and they were talking about how the band Coheed and C- C- Cambria like the lead singer writes comic books and then their music is like a uh, like a companion to the comic books and like how it'd be f- cool to incorporate that into video games. Well, I would get Simogo to do a rhythm action game where it's it'd be some kind of like indie game you know with a story some kind of mechanics obviously but then there would be parts with music that would be essentially like a rhythm game and then that would be kind of like a cutscene in a way you know so it's basically a musical game in the sense that like a musical movie has people singing at certain points it'd be like that and it looks um, like a lot of fun it would be a great way one thing that i love doing is I love uh, supporting independent creators. And Mm -hmm. I found a few independent music artists on TikTok that I think are legitimately great. Like, it's not even like, oh, well, you know, they're pretty good for being independent. No, they're, like, really good. So I think this could be a great way to, you know, get up-and-coming artists and say, hey, I'm making this game, you know, music is a big factor in it do you want to have your song that you're trying to promote in my game you know so then uh, imagine like playing the game finding certain songs that you love 
and then go and supporting those artists so they get even more recognition and attention. Like, I think it's a win on all fronts. It'd be the kind of video game that you don't see too much, at least as far as I'm concerned. And yeah, it would be a great way to put music into a game in a way that's not just a soundtrack. Like, it would be part of the game. So I think you could bring in a wide variety of uh, players with this one. It's interesting. I'm going to start calling you the Shuhei Yoshida of our podcast. (laughs) Yeah, I was checking this out, and I'm not sure if you know, but there's a couple inspirations I like about the Sinai Wild Hearts game. I know um, Geometry Dash in particular has this concept where the flow of the, I guess, the music character varies and i like how you start with one thing but jump to another and like the seamless transition that's yeah definitely a neat touch um, yeah, it's, another th- it's unlike any game i've ever played <laughs> another thing i like is it kind of is like have you ever heard of the game thumper before i've heard yeah of it, yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so it kind of has it like i mean um, the music is different but it has that like intense i guess um action to music response type of thing and i like how they portray that synergy between music and action i like it that is a very interesting um pick it's the one you don't it's one you're not going to see um you know big publishers go for immediately that's something you know more risky i would say yeah, but if it works, it pays off. Exactly. You could, you could say it's a weird game published by a weirdo interactive studio. Because it's interactive. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> it fits. All right. That uh, concludes our second round. So, Andy, you're up. All right. Uh, next one up. Uh, this one's also a little bit... This one's actually a mixed bag between common stuff and some unique things um this is actually under gearbox actually i'm okay. sure a, a lot of you know gearbox for stuff like borderlands and stuff like duke nukem and Bulletstorm. but they do have a few other niche games under its title you know because of it being a publisher that really caught my eye some of it are risk of rain 2 that one is one of my favorite games of all time. Just constant replayability. Uh, Tribes of Midgard is a game most people probably haven't heard of, but that is actually like a Viking themed survival game in a sense. It's a, it's a um, that's a top down. Yeah, it's like isometric. Isometric, okay. Yeah, and then Remnant from the Ashes. This was actually one of those, I guess, under the radar games that was really good and would have done better if it released at a different time. Remnant from the Ashes is kind of like a Dark Souls shooter from a third-person, over-the-shoulder perspective. And then wrapping it up is Have a Nice Death, which is a 2D action roguelike. Um, Gearbox really takes gameplay as its core. This one is kind of like the meat and bones, I guess, from my operation here. A lot of these games I've listed are in its fundamentals fun games by itself and i kind of want to enforce games that you can pick up and play and just feel like i can wait for a sequel because this game right here is really good just enough to play by itself and gearbox actually has you know home console ports so accessibility for this one would be the one most people would be able to you know easily obtain in some shape or form yeah that's a great pick um it's funny that you said was it tribes of midgard and remnant from the ashes because both of those games were actually on playstation plus so oh yeah i think uh i know i know for a fact i have both them in my library i can't remember about risk of rain but i didn't realize gearbox was behind all that yeah definitely i mean um there are game companies that actually worked on it that are different but Mm -hmm. under the the moniker gearbox that's like the the parent um publisher that made it happen yeah that 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 works i like that pick gearbox all right so on to mine i have two uh big studios right insomniac sucker punch 
Mm-hmm. Now, my third studio, actually, they have never, uh, they have not released a game yet. Oh. <laughs> oh, okay. That's risky. So that, exactly. And I put it this high up on my, uh, on my list because it is Ghost Story Games. Uh, founder is Ken Levine. And Ken Levine, of course, is the creator of Bioshock. Oh, okay. So Ghost Story Games was created in um, 2017, and they've been working on a game called Judas. They first showed it off at the Game Awards a few months ago. The, Ken Levine specifically is one of the creators or developers that perfectly fits into, into my publisher. He's all about the narrative he creates amazing stories so i love i love how um at insomniac and sucker punch they create those um those narratives and those interesting stories so i think ghost story games and ken levine fits right in there i think you know if they were to come out with um judas under my publisher that would be a huge hit but just the fact of having ken levine on to have um narrative driven games like this uh, whether it's uh, Bioshock inspired or, or whatnot, anything like that, I think would perfectly fit. Um, whether it's first person, third person, whatever. So I, I would go. I would take a chance on Ghost Story Games and um, go ahead and add them to the publisher and see what they can do. Nice. Pretty simple, yeah. pretty simple pick. But you know, I think I think that is one you take a, you take a chance on, and it's it would pay off. Absolutely. All right, so that's my third pick, and then we'll move on to uh, Shuhei Yoshida himself for the third pick. <laughs> uh, let me get Ghost Story Games. Okay, my next pick. Um, let's see. I'm trying to. S- okay, yeah, my next pick is uh again. I'm not sure if I'm going to say this wrong. Uh, Wadjet. I Studios, uh, W A D, and then Jet J E T. Um, they made a game that I played on Switch that's also on PC called Unavowed. It's a point and click RPG set in like a like a like a modern fantasy setting. Um, this is a genre that's always been a blind spot for me. I had uh rise of the dragon on sega genesis as a kid and i never knew what the heck i had to do so i just was like well i'm not gonna play this this game's weird <laughs> but you know like playing this game it's it's a rpg in the sense that like there are a few party members that you get throughout the story but obviously it's a point and click game so that's what you're doing but like dude the the art design the characters uh the presentation the story like it's as immersive as you know like any like regular fantasy game you can get you know like it's never b- boring like you know you're just pointing and clicking like there are like certain dialogue choices you can make that affect things and y- you know that's my thing um and it has one of the best story twists i've seen in a game when it was happening i just sat there staring at my switch like wait what like it was it was brilliant so i i actually this is the first one of mine that i have a bit a broad idea for it'd be like like a psychological horror game that's like the main character is like he has like hallucinations and stuff like he's delusional and then so it'd be like a point and click game centered around like investigating shadows and like just that idea of like clicking on a shadow you know like a shadowy part of an area and like are you gonna see something scary or is it gonna be nothing you know like to put you in the main character's state of mind um so yeah i i love unavowed i love this studio uh, they made this other game called the exposition uh the excavation of hobbs barrow that is also a point and click game not f- fantasy necessarily but more horror it looks really interesting so i think this is a studio to look out for in my opinion um and 
even for people that aren't a fan of that genre, um, I think they can make g- g- video games that have a look to them that would draw anybody in. Like, if they got me to play a point-and-click game, which is a genre I've never had any patience for, I mean, I think they could do pretty much anything. Um, uh, yeah, I'm on their website now, looking at all the games. Old Skies, to me, looks very interesting. So, I love the art style and everything. I see what you're talking about. Definitely one to take a chance on and, and give your gives your publisher a lot of um, uh, charm to it. Interesting. The exva- exva- excavation of Hobbs Borrow. That's that's a new game. That's their yeah. I think one. it's. I think it might have been from last year, maybe or maybe this year. I'm not sure. Interesting. Okay, added that to the list. Man, these that is uh, weirdo. That fits. <laughs> looking at just looking at the top three. I love it. All right, Andrew Tate. For the fourth pick. Yeah, and I guess um, if this is going to be for the number four, I wanted to go and kind of round this up with Turtle Rock Studios. And I actually love three games in particular. They might have more, but the big ones in particular are... Yeah, I know Evolve is a really big one. I loved playing that to death. Back for Blood is a bit more in the recent spectrum, and that one is kind of in par with Left for Dead. I don't know if they were Turtle, Turtle Rock Studios then, but it's the same crew, so the translation is not that, you know, not that big of a deal. But the thing that kind of roots this together is it's got a core multiplayer experience, and for the most part, it's up to four players, but Within those four players, you have this, I guess, spectrum that each time you play, it's going to be a a phenomenal experience at the best and at the worst, um, an amusing one, just because you have all these elements that you throw into the game. And I want my studio to take elements of that core multiplayer and just allow people to just have fun, you know, whether it be by beside each other on the couch or online, you know, if you could do like a, a group party type of thing, but the ability to take a game and share it with others, kind of strengthening the experience with more people available if you have that you know, opportunity to do so. I like it. Turtle Rock's a great pick. Great pick. Thank you. Um, yeah, Evolve was a lot of fun. I played that. I think Back for Blood was my f- probably my favorite. Um, it's hard to judge that in Left 4 Dead because Left 4 Dead's a classic. Oh yeah, no doubt. But um, yeah, Evolve. The problem with that was just it released at such an awkward time. It did, yeah. and it didn't have as much hype as the games that were released around there. And unfortunately, the popularity for it kind of fizzed out. Even when they made it free to play, just didn't get enough backing up for. I agree. Great pick. All right, moving on to my fourth pick. And before before I say what it is, I just want to say, you know, my publisher is about narrative games. Mm-hmm. And you can say that the narrative that uh, the narrative behind the games yeah, for this developer, they're terrible. Mm-hmm. But I saw an article the other day of somebody praising this developer for its its narrative in, in its latest game. And this team is none other than Team Sonic. Oh. I think it fits. All right, hear me out. They're getting better with the way that they tell uh, the, the narratives and the story in their games. They have a bit to go yet, though. They do. And what I thought is, okay, what if they're in a publisher full of um geniuses like Nate Fox <laughs> and Ken Levine and you know my next pick if I get it you know the last of hedgehogs I can't wait the last of the hedgehogs <laughs> <laughs> no but team sonic fits it's uh it's that fun kinetic action platformer 
that has a story behind it too. And you know, Sonic has a, a what almost now, well, actually, yeah, three decades worth of of games and stories. You know, mm-hmm. when you take that into consideration, what other franchise has been around for three decades with, you know, somewhat of a cohesive story, be- you know, story behind it? Mm-hmm. There's not many. So if we can just give them some credit for that, I think if they're around, uh, you know, talent that, you know, talent involving creating stories and narratives. I like what they do with their mechanics, the way they create their games. Sonic games are fun. I think they fit, you know, let's just, let's help them out a little bit with the narrative. I think they would be a great pick rounding out the, uh, you know, maybe more of the, you know, younger audience would be interested in this. Cause I'm not sure about how much the younger audience is into, um, Go, you know, a ghost story games type of game, or even a Ghost of Tsushima or um, Insomniac game. And say Insomniac probably brings in the most people, but I think Team Sonic rounds out the demographic a little bit too. So I think that would be a solid pick to kind of um, have the publisher have a little bit more reach within, you know, its audience. Okay, so, so you're looking for more of like an introductory type of this um, one publisher yes. uh, team for the publisher, yeah, yeah. So that that would kind of be the goal of, of Team Sonic, and I think it I think it would I think it would work. Yeah, they could pull it off with a mascot character or something like that. Got to go fast. Yep, <laughs> you're too slow. <laughs> All right, that's my that's my fourth. All right, Vandal Savage, back to you for your fourth. All right, so uh, like uh, your pick uh, for Ghost Story games, my next one is. Also hasn't well actually they've never mind they've actually released two games I forgot dang it but um their upcoming one that I'm excited for is Bomb Rush Cyberfunk this is Team Reptile um essentially this game is just a spiritual successor to Jet Set Radio you know it has that s- similar vibe to it. Um, and that's, I think in some ways that might be my favorite game of all time because it's the one that I think about the most. It's influenced a lot of things that I love in terms of like, you know, like music, like the vibe of games. It has this like weird, you know, off kilter vibe. Um, it's like a little sandboxy, but it's not open world, but like you could travel between certain points, just, you know, riding through the city. And stuff like that is just, you know, really fun. The characters are charming and memorable. The art style is perfect, in my opinion. Um, Yeah, so I would... I don't necessarily have any specific ideas other than it would just involve, like... You know, like, whether you're, like, riding something or maybe, like, a ensemble cast of people with, like, powers and stuff. Just... Like fast, frenetic movement, um, arcadey fun, um, you know, just a lighthearted fun story. Nothing. I'm usually like really big on story, but every now and then you just got to play something that's just fun. You know that j- that's a vibe. You know, it doesn't have to challenge you philosophically. It can just be, you know, just a fun time. So well, and Bomb Rush Cyberfunk th- is a vibe. I'm watching yeah. the trailer. Yeah. It's a vibe. Yeah, I can't. If I didn't work with this d- developer, I wouldn't consider myself a, r- a real gamer, in my opinion. It- it's just that simple. And it would be a great way. I don't think anyone there ha- has worked on the Jet Set Radio games, but it would still kind of be a way for really? me to like. Wow. I don't think so. Um, It might be. Yeah. I think the composer did Jet Set Radio. Okay. But yeah, either way, it-, it would be a great way to put my stamp on a uh, kind of formula that c- captured my heart when I was a kid. Great pick for the weirdo publisher. Yeah, that that game specifically looks awesome. All right, Andy, fifth pick. Fifth pick. Now, a lot of these are going to be a little bit more, I guess, indie-based because they're kind of the ones that catch my attention but one that really stands out i want to make sure i secure this one is from a 
publisher slash indie dev company named Hempuli Oi. And just hearing that is going to sound completely random, but I'm not sure if you know this, but they are the makers of Baba Is You, if you've ever heard of that before. I, I can't I can't put my uh yeah. Okay, so Baba is you is it's one of those like hidden gem type of games, and here's what makes it interesting. It's a puzzle based game where there are, you know, you have a character that you control and then there's text. The text is an interactable in the game. So the first one starting off is Baba is you. You're like this rabbit and the name is Baba and then flag is win it's almost like programming logic because the thing that gets crazy is that you can push these words around and you can make them different things and these different things change in real time as you modify them in the level puzzle that you're doing so you might have one that says wall of stop but then if you move the wind tag, move that down to right after is the preposition, then it's like wall is win. So then Baba just goes to the wall and he wins instead of having to even touch the flag. And then uh, the I'm kind of getting that's you know, interesting. derailed a bit. But no, um, yeah, but to wrap it back in topic, they take a game and they give you tools to just completely break it. And... I like the structure of taking something that's supposed to be a foundation of what you expect it to be, and the game dev just goes, you know what, let's see what the players do. Let's see what they're capable of doing, and they do some of the crazy stuff. I mean, some of the the, the puzzle solutions that you end up having to do and get so crazy, it even breaks the overworld of where you select the I guess the puzzle missions, like it goes really meta. And then you have level editors that you can make for the community to play. And then they go even deeper, like down the rabbit hole. But overall, this game is a hidden gem because it takes um, the concept of how you would anticipate playing the game and just says, nah, we don't care about the rules. They're just a suggestion. And I want my games to try and challenge that um, technical approach so that someone can be open-minded to new possibilities that in that game it has almost unanimous tens out of tens and fives out of fives too that that's a hit oh yeah it's it's a cult classic i mean if you know about it you'll love it to death yeah it seems like it that's interesting i've never heard of that game or the studio so it's on mobile too so it's easy enough for anyone to pick up and play um obviously steam a console but yeah it's accessible to a lot of people and once you start figuring how it works you're genuinely invested in trying to see how how much can i break the game now i like it okay i'm I'm gonna run to the bathroom real quick all right I'm so glad he's running to the bathroom because he's going to get mad at my next pick. Uh oh. <laughs> I wonder if he can hear me. I'm just going to go. I'm going to do my next pick now before before he comes back. <laughs> okay. All I right. was going to say my next pick is complete uh, in complete contrast to yours. Yeah. I'm, I'm picking Kojima Productions. Oh yeah, there we go. This is what you have. Okay, and this is what you're stuck with. This. Hear me out. Okay. It makes sense. Uh, yeah, the narrative's definitely good, but sometimes confusing. It, and you know what? Mm-hmm. It is what it is. It is. I need a talent like Hideo Kojima in my uh, publishing. Okay. You know, it, it, with sure. my publisher. Now, are you going to take real-life inspiration in the same vein that Kojima does? Honestly, he might just take over my publisher. I don't know. Yeah, you never know. It might just be, it might not say Polaris. It might just say Kojima. Kojima, yeah. (laughs) That's the gamble, bringing him on board. Um, Yeah. But the types of games that he creates, think about the narrative behind Metal Gear Solid games and um, Death Stranding. A lot of political influence, yeah. Yeah, and it's just interesting stories. Like, imagine, you know, think back to the first time you played Death Stranding. Mm Mm-hmm. The more you get through that game, think of just 
it's an insane story and world, not just story, but insane worlds that he creates. Yeah, not without even the context, story. It's, yes, it makes no sense without knowing it. And and I love that. And I think, I think someone like Kojima brings it, it brings in so many. It, it for one, it brings in it gets a lot of attention. It gets a lot of eyes. Absolutely. On, on his products. And I think this would bring in a whole other demographic, um, which would be uh, Japan, that audience. Sure. Same, same with Sonic, but mm -hmm. I, I'm thinking Sonic more for the younger demographic, but Kojima more so for um, Japanese influence and that audience. Because I'm looking at my my teams I have, and I want to have teams that have a a reach to them. Insomniac, they're from uh, California and North Carolina. Sucker Punch is from, I believe, Washington. Um, Ghost Story, I want to say like Massachusetts. Um, and then you got Team Sonic and Kojima, both from Japan. So it kind of uh, reaches a, a wider audience with that. And also it's Kojima. I mean, it, it's going to be bringing in a lot of money. It's going to be bringing in a lot of uh, people mm -hmm. so yeah you're going for the more international demographic now yeah with that i'm thinking that i'm thinking that and it's funny actually looking at my next few picks yeah i'm, I'm gonna have a very um international publisher but i kind of want that mm -hmm. um because that brings different uh, cultures into your publisher different feels uh different feel for your games um so I think yeah. that's I think that's a solid pick. So sure, and you allow for different people to try, you know, getting themselves acclimated to it. If they're more deeply rooted in a certain style, you might be able to make a game that caters to the, you know, to that particular group, and they might, you know, latch onto it in the same way with that particular approach. Yeah, because nothing is like a Kojima game. There's nothing, nothing out there. Absolutely nothing. Nothing. Even even a Ken Levine game, it doesn't. It's not quite a Kojima. You know what I mean? The Kojima it, exactly. game is it, it holds its own flair. I mean, it, you say it, the name itself, and people are expecting nothing. You can't... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, Tony, you back. Yeah, what was your pick? Oh, no. I picked Kojima Productions. Oh, of course. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry, I had to do it. I've actually I was never saying... like played... I've never really even like played one of his games yet. Oh, really? I mean, I played some of uh, D D Death Stranding. Mm, okay. But yeah. I just wasn't in the right mindset for that. <laughs> yeah, so basically, Kojima fits, you know, um, nothing's quite like a Kojima game. The stories and the narratives that he creates yeah. and the absolutely insane worlds he creates, I think it's essential for a publisher like mine who's trying to accomplish, you know, crazy um stories and and experiences sure yeah definitely all right so then okay this is what we're gonna do we're gonna go uh tony to you for the fifth pick and then what we'll do is we'll give a rundown of our top five and then we'll continue on to uh till we get to 10 and then that'll be our 10 and then we'll just go through our last two picks um to round it out yeah okay okay all right so give me your fifth all right, my fifth is Super Giant Games, baby. Ooh. Now, Love it. roguelikes or and rogue roguelites by extension are never they're not a genre I'm well versed in. Um, yeah, but uh, Hades was really the first one I not the first one I played, but it was one that I played and I was like. Oh, this is why people like this. Okay, you know, like I obviously yeah, me the too. Greek. Yeah, there you go. That's the <laughs> that's the demographic right there. <laughs> obviously, the Greek mythology setting is cool, but like I, I love that it's still an RPG and that like you can level up. So it's not like when you die, it's like oh, back to square one. Dang it! It's like no, See? I'm I'm Someone that much stronger. <laughs> um. I didn't beat That's it. I was trying to play too many games at one time, so I fell off of it. But I'm gonna restart it soon and just play that. That'll be See, like best a, decision I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah, that'll be like a great after work game. You know, just play a few rounds. It is, and it exactly. Um, See, easy so, enough for anyone to pick up and play. <laughs> so my 
my idea around my roguelite would be it would be based on reincarnation okay. you know with the you know because you're going to be dying a lot so it would be it wouldn't be like story heavy necessarily but although hades is so i i think i could put a pretty good story in there um and so like when you die you essentially like there'd be like a few classes and then when you die you randomly get reincarnated as like a different class so like you could go from like being a knight to being an archer to being <gasps> a, like barbarian or something like that and cool. then the idea and like maybe the setting would change too but the evil enemy that you're fighting would still be the same so that it could be a cool illustration of like how like the cycle of evil you know i'm fighting against evil and injustice and certain things never goes away no matter what time period you're living in so that could be a cool thing and then it would just be a fun gameplay mechanic because it would make player like say maybe you, you know like you've gotten pretty far as one class and then you're like okay this is kind of getting a little redundant you die and now you have to learn essentially a different game kind of and there would still be the element of like leveling up your class with like a skill tree or something so every time you die and get reincarnated as the as whatever other class it's like okay now i want to try to get these abilities so that before i die so that next time i come back so i think you could do really ambitious things with the genre i know that now i have seen the truth um and yeah i think you could re i'd really like to bring my sensibilities to the genre and create something truly special yeah well that's you, a perfect team to do it with you know what my agent will get in touch with you because i think <laughs> we're gonna do a collab and oh, when yeah. you mentioned that the game concept that you just described is you know similar to one of my favorite games rogue legacy and rogue legacy is a lineage <laughs> yeah it's a lineage game so it's very similar to what you just described um basically you have to scour through a castle and you start as a class but once you die you're basically the next um in the family line and the family line could be a completely different class and they have different perks and um, disabilities and it provides a mm. different challenge each time you die giving you a reason to pick it back up and go in there again but yeah definitely i'm everything you said is spot on the fact that you picked super giant <laughs> means me and you will be collaborating in the near future i knew super some of that about team. rogue legacy but i didn't know about the changing class thing um it's yeah, hopefully it's, i can download that on my vita of, from the memory card that i got but I'm i believe gonna, you can I do want to play that at some point because I hear it's a great beginner uh, roguelite game. Yeah, and it matches that exact concept of um, you know dying, starting over, and you do have progression that makes certain you have like buildings, and I use that term loosely that you use to upgrade certain family trees. Like if you want to focus on the archer line or the mage line, oh, you sweet. can do that, and that basically puts your character. And that play style. So if you don't like your character, you might just say, you know what, I'm just going to suicide switch to this, and mm. now I'm going to focus on this play style. Awesome. Yeah, Love no it. doubt. And Andy, you can just go ahead and go into your um, six pick. Six pick is another kind of obscure game, and this one's called All Interactive. And this is going back into roguelites, obviously, but this one is a game probably haven't heard of. I'm going to say it anyway. It's called Bullets Per Minute BPM. Uh, does that name sound familiar? I just... Yes. Yes. It, yes? <laughs> all, okay. All interactive. Their only game, BPM, right? Yeah. Yep. So this is kind of like the original. And another game kind of did something shortly after this. The second game, this is non-related whatsoever it is actually i don't have it on me but there's another game that basically it, back on track yeah bpm is a roguelite that is inspired by music so the theme of this is that you're playing in rhythm 
And this is the first of its kind. You're taking a roguelite, a game where you're progressing and procedurally generated content, and you're changing it with a different genre altogether. It involves music now, and you're like, okay, what's going on? I, this is actually catchy. This is really good. I'm enjoying this. And you don't anticipate the two working, but when you actually play it for yourself, it's really good. And I just found the second game. This is non-related, but the other game is called Metal Hellsinger. Maybe you've heard of that one. That's a little bit more recent. Yeah, I've seen gameplay footage from that. It looks bonkers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so Metal Hellsinger took huge inspiration from Bolts Per Minute. Um, their thing with Hellsinger is it's more rock heavy metal type of thing but bpm just kind of roots it into a more I mean, it's also rock but it has a more it's the original concept and yeah. the the gra- the graphics are simple there's no getting around that but what i like about what this company did is they took two conflicting game types of genre and blended into a seamless experience and if i want to take this under the simple games i wanted to try and see if i can make an explorative you know type of equivalent maybe it'll be um if i had to come with it a maybe a point and click platformer maybe something of that nature not necessarily that specific but you know two obscure um communities and bring it together into one it's it's funny you brought that up because I actually had uh, interactive pulled up on my computer. There's um, one of my picks is from a studio that helps co-develop uh, VPM. Oh, okay. But that's a great pick. I, I had like a feeling this, you were going to pick that. It looks like uh, <laughs> this is the second time Andy and I will be working together. Yep, you know what? I think I'm seeing this theme. It's another roguelite music inspired game. I'm, I'm going to send you my, my information. You'll hear from my agent and we'll start the process. Heck yeah, we're going to shake the industry, man. <laughs> exactly. You know what? Weirder Interactive and Simple Game Productions presents. That's awesome. All right. Um, <laughs> and then my sixth, Respawn Entertainment. Ooh, really good pick. Yes, Respawn Entertainment absolute underdogs when it comes to storytelling they have Mm -hmm. titanfall titanfall 2 star wars jedi fallen order and then star wars jedi survivor which will be out um later this year they also make apex legends which is a master (laughs) class in itself of gameplay it depends on who you ask not the biggest fan of it but it is it's a pretty popular game anyways biased but whatever yeah me too but titanfall 2 specifically yes there we go. That game is incredible. I would definitely bring back the Titanfall series with Respawn yep. Entertainment. And then, of course, elaborate um, with the Star Wars universe. Star sure. Wars, favorite IP. Um, Titanfall, I, honestly, one of the one of the best first-person shooter games ever. Especially if you're, you know, talking about narrative and story. Mm-hmm. One of the best. So I think Respawn Entertainment is is pivotal. If, if not, maybe it should be uh, higher on my list than than six. But it's definitely a studio uh, that needs to be in this publisher. Yeah, no doubt. Yep, Respawn Entertainment. All right, that's my that's my sixth. And now we'll move on to Tony. And my number six is number six is Atlas. Ooh. With- oh, here we go. A T L U S, not A T L A S. Yeah, I, I remember reading the spelling on that, but remind me what games they have for that. So they've released and published a lot. Uh, they're most known for the Shin Megami Tensei franchise and the spinoff of that, the Persona franchise. There we go. <laughs> um, and man, so like in 2020, I checked out a. a little game a little not well-known game called persona 5 oh you don't say um and i was i've never really been an rpg fan i played the kingdom Hearts series those are rpgs but they, they never felt like it to me they just felt like fun action adventure games um <clears throat> i played most of final fantasy 15 final fantasy 7 remake mm-hmm. other than that though that genre is like 
never really been my thing, but God, I don't know. Persona Five is it's a really long game, but it's like one of those few games in that genre that once I start playing it, it's hard for me to stop. Like it, it's a visual novel life sim with dungeon crawling RPG elements, and they do this masterful thing where those two game, those two halves of the game are like separate things. So, like, if you're done, you know, crawling through the dungeons, you could leave and then do the social sim aspect. And if you, like, hang out with your friends and stuff, you, like, level up their social link and you get, like, certain perks that make going through the RPG side easier. Um, you could visit shops and stuff to buy items. Uh, just walk around the city. Uh, the soundtrack, oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, the art style, oh my god. Yeah. The characters are fun, memorable. I've reached a point where I I was starting to feel like maybe they were starting to feel one note, and then I reached a section with two of them where they said some stuff about their personal lives, and I was like, oh god, now I'm sad. And I'm at a part of a game where I'm going through someone's palace, and it's it's a sad story. It's It's just crazy. So... I would love to work with them and just do more or less what they're doing. I, I wouldn't want them to change their formula too, too much. Um, I would want to do like a Persona style game, but like through more of a Western lens, you know? So like something, I'm a really big fan of like Telltale style games and stuff like that, you know, made for like a Western audience. So I would want to bring those sensibilities, but have Atlas kind of tap into that. So it's, you know, like you're visiting like cities that we would know. So it feels, you know, so like people playing it in the U.S. could be like, I've been there. I've been there. I want to, I've always wanted to travel there. Um, yeah, not much else to say other than I love Persona 5. I can't wait to play the other ones and lose the the semblance of a social life I have left. Oh, don't worry, you'll have one in the game. <laughs> yeah, that's your second life. <laughs> I'll take Atlas it. is good for that. That's a that's a great pick. Atlas is a amazing uh, studio. All right, six pick, and um, that was your six pick. Now we're moving to the seventh pick for uh, Andy. Okay, now this one, I'm kind of going with a little bit more. You know. These are all going to basically be indie games, but this one's a little bit more rooted. I'm going to go with Team Cherry for my seventh pick. Uh, all Team right. Cherry, the the main game in particular is Hollow Knight, which is a side-scrolling Dark Souls inspired, I guess you want to call it action. It's just more like an adventure type of game. But the thing about this particular, you know, publisher is that they kind of blend IPs together in their own game. So they take inspiration from, uh, you know, you know, Dark Souls, but it's not quite Dark Souls. So what I want to use this for this company, uh, the team, is I want to try and kind of take a spin off of things that people already know and just kind of have people do double tick like wait is it this but just like this instead something where you kind of get a familiar feel for it from a different perspective I like it that is um that's a great pick team cherry um hollow knight is huge that game Absolutely. is is um a huge hit for an indie uh studio I should say. Silk Song is a very, you know, it's a highly anticipated game coming out. If it comes out. <laughs> if it comes out. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. Yeah. Um, great pick. Again, my next pick will be in complete contrast to that. Yeah, of course. So, moving on to my seventh, Bungie. Blah. <laughs> Here's why. I think <coughs> I think what is an underrated aspect of Bungie is actually um, their um, narrative, you know, talent. 
Mm. One of the best things about the original um, Halo trilogy, you know, obviously it's the gameplay, but an underrated aspect of it is the fact that it had a cohesive story throughout that trilogy. And the story the story was good. And that was a game from from 2001 to 2007, a uh, trilogy mm-hmm. of games with a great story. One of my favorite Halos is Halo 3 ODST. Oh, out, that's a good one. Yeah, it came out in 2009 because I just love the atmosphere and story of that. Yeah. It- yeah, so they have, you know, that's part of their um, their history. Now, modern day, you got Destiny. Mm-hmm. I love the story of Destiny. It is, you know, the game is so much fun to play, but the worlds they create. Um, I don't, I don't even need to get into the specifics of it, but they, they're very interesting with, you know, the world they create and the story they tell in it. Uh, very similar to my other picks, like um, a Ghost Story Games or even a Kojima or mm. Respawn. I guess I think Bungie just fits with that. I think. If Bungie made a third-person game, like think of the third-person aspects of Destiny. If they made a full-fledged third-person action game with, you know, the stories they're able to create, I think they would be um, a perfect fit for this publisher. I mean, look at the chops they have. They have they're one of the best live service uh, game developers, game studios. So, I think they just bring a lot to the table and can offer a lot. I, they're one of the probably the most talented and and. Um, you know, studios out there with a wide range of, of talent. Yeah, quick question. Do you anticipate the community air quote bastardizing it like the, you know, the Rooster Teeth series um, Red vs. Blue? Honestly, if anything, that would be um, a, a plus to bringing them on because that would just bring more attention to it. Sure. Um, it, you know, think about how popular um, you know, not Halo specifically, but that aspect of Halo became because of that. People were are dying for Red versus Blue within Forge or within the games itself. Yeah. So if they would do that um, to you know a product, I think I think you could uh, get some get something out of that. Have some kind of you know success or or something from that. I'm not really no, worried about it. Yeah. So you're saying the community's influence would be something that you would help you know. You would anticipate boosting, I guess, the popularity of your company in particular. Yeah, I don't, you know, I think they're talented enough to where that doesn't matter. I think the product can stand, excuse, stand for itself. And if that happens, I think it would only be a plus. Okay, yeah, I just didn't know if you were be worried if it was overshadowed by the community's efforts versus what you were contributing Listen, on that front. To what you just said, I'd be more worried about that with um, the Sonic games. Yeah, <laughs> if they made a Sonic <laughs> fan series off of that, I would be flabbergasted. But I'd be impressed that they pulled it off. Well, <laughs> all right, <laughs> all right. <laughs> We're not going to get into the Sonic. Uh, not uh, yeah, not this episode. Yeah, not this. Episode. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, who are we on, Tony? You're seven. Mm-hmm. Okay, my next pick is an indie studio. Uh, they're known for <laughs> they're known for Murasaki Baby, which is like a weird puzzle platformer where you hold a baby's hand and you have to lead him through the environments. I'm kind of afraid to play that, to be honest, because if the baby can die, I might just uh, have a mental Do breakdown. Do it on purpose. <laughs> no, I might just have a mental breakdown. And I'm like, oh my god, the baby's dead. Um, What's the studio? Speed run. <laughs> Avant a V A N T and then garden, but it's all one word. Okay. I think Sounds they used like to have a children. different name, so <laughs> that might kind of throw you off. Um, and they've also made a game, one of my favorite indie games I've played in a while, Last Day of June. Oh, I've heard of that. Never um, really yeah. picked it's it up. It's basically, without spoiling anything, it basically explores grief and how Mm -hmm. you feel after losing somebody and kind of imagining like, well, if, you know, if I could have done this differently or changed this, maybe that wouldn't have happened, you know, kind of thing. So I want to take that and apply it to the multiverse, which is a thing I love and hate. I I hate how oversaturated it is now, but Mm -hmm. I just, I've always been enamored with that idea of like, 
how could our lives have been different? You know, so I would make a game that's still in the same scope as that, more or less. Um, and it'd be like you, maybe one main character or maybe a few main characters. It'd be like you like switch between their POVs and then they all have one thing in life they feel like they're lacking, you know, and like maybe it could be represented by like a p- puzzle that like they're like a puzzle that would purposely be designed so that the players won't be able to solve it. And then the idea is like, they like try and imagine things happening in their life in a different way. And then basically the main thesis of the game would be like, no matter how many lives, you know, you might've had instead of the one you have now changing anything isn't going to make you happy. The only thing that's going to make you happy is finding peace and finding contentment with where you are. So it'd be a big, you know, emotional thing, emotionally driven. Uh, Cause last day of June really did that for me. And then it has this narrative twist at the end that I won't spoil, but um, it really threw me off guard. And then like I read people's interpretations and it made me go from thinking it was a really good game that made me emotional to a really genius game that made me emotional um yeah so i think you know working with a studio who's only made two games it's not like they've done that much it could be a really cool way to like provide them with more resources you know and help them get more of the recognition that i think they really deserve i like it that's a great pick yeah i like the concept of taking things and giving the player the opportunity to a Adapt a mentality that takes a positive spin. And I know you kind of briefly mentioned the whole puzzle concept. One thing I think that'd be interesting is if you were at an area, like you said, you just couldn't beat it, and then you just basically are allowed to skip it. But then at the very end of the gameplay, you go back to that in a different perspective. And it's like, that was the answer all along. Oh, yeah, hmm. that'd be interesting. Yeah. I like it. Great pick. Um, that concludes that, I believe. So, Andy, your eighth pick. Eighth pick. All right. So, I talked a bit about All Interactive briefly, and what I said was partially untrue. So, eighth pick is going to be Brace Yourself Games, and they did make some other lesser-known games, uh, just listening to Phantom Brigade and Interests of Titan, but the big one is Crypt of the Necrodancer. Mm, what I meant okay. to say before, um, Bolts Per Minute was the first first-person shooter roguelite rhythm game. This is probably one of the more original roguelite music games, period. And this is done as like a top-down view, not isometric, it was pixelated. Um, but the roguelite concept is very, you know, rooted. The soundtrack is really good. And on PC for sure, you can actually put your own um, custom songs in there. You might be able to do that on console. Don't quote me on that specifically. But um, one thing I like about this game that the developer did for this is it kind of goes back to all interactive of mixing two together. But the gameplay that they provide ended up being solid and well-rounded for what they were accomplishing. So All Interactive was just like, hey, let's make these two together, see how it works. And it ended up really well. This is more like, hey, this is a roguelite with music elements, but the roguelite elements in here are actually really good. The foundation is set. So what I like about Brace Yourself, that what they did is that they took something as their core foundation, like a simple games would have, you know, I guess maybe a handful of games that are like their core game, but they might try something different, but still resonate with their philosophy of initial, you know, their initial demographics, such the games that they want to present being fine-tuned to be really good for that audience playing it. Well, they made um, Cadence of Hyrule. 
Oh yeah, that was um on Nintendo Switch. But yeah, yeah, that's actually a spinoff to Crypt of the Necrodancer. So yes. that is a collab with Legend of Zelda. Yeah, I, I've always wanted to play that game. I didn't realize that they made uh, Crypt of the Necrodancer. Yeah, it was Crypt first, and then I guess that Cadence one. I, yep. I, and now I Rift of the over. Necrodancer is uh, that one. Yeah, it's an out. interesting one. Rift of the like Necrodancer. A, Warrior. It's like a, oh, okay. Yeah, that does look like Warrior. Yeah, exactly. so it's like inspiration from Warrior and Rhythm Heaven, but that one, yeah, is also by Brace Yourself. The yeah, Crypt of the Necrodancer IP is really successful in that company, and they are doing things outside of it, which is catching a lot of buzz. I mean, I think you knew about the Cadence of Hyrule. Yeah, yeah, that's a great pick, because they're only going to get bigger uh, from here on out. Yeah, no doubt. All right, and, um, you know, we got to keep this same theme of, of you picking Being opposites. This, being opposites. Uh, being I'm going to go with uh, Ubisoft Montreal. Oh my god. Oh no, Ubisoft, get out. <laughs> get off your own show. <laughs> Here's why. I gotta go. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Here's why. Hear me out. Splinter Cell. Okay, okay. but is that your saving grace though? <laughs> it's gonna have to be. <laughs> so that you're you're picking Ubisoft just because they did one IP that was good and they haven't it, touched in ages. <laughs> I'm bringing it back. Splinter <laughs> Cell it ba- Splinter Cell needs to come back and be done right. Splinter oh, Cell's yeah. coming back. Yeah, let's bring back Splinter Cell with RPG elements. No, and no. Let's, let's, let's gate the content. Oh, you want to assassinate this target? Oh, you have to do these side missions before <laughs> you're good enough to even, you know, kill a person. All here's, right, yep. <laughs> here's why. Because if I'm in charge of this, <laughs> Splinter Cell's coming back. It's going to be single player game. It's, that's it. There's not going to be any of that in it. <laughs> Same thing with Assassin's Creed. We're going to be get, bringing back Assassin's Creed. Now, Ubisoft Montreal actually is not making Assassin's Creed Mirage, I believe. Okay, I don't know I think what that their is, specific branch is. Uh, what's the other one that's making this? I forget which one's making Mirage, but I don't believe it's Ubisoft Montreal. Anyways, I'd be taking Assassin's Creed. It'd be going back. And then Far Cry would just be getting crazier and crazier. Like yeah. we talked about on last episode with um, some ideas I have for Far Cry. Um, huh. So those three, basically those three IP, um, you know, Prince of Persia could come back, I guess. Would you bring um, back Rayman? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Rayman's coming back for sure. Good. All right. I think that uh, I'll forgive you for bringing Rayman back. <laughs> well, that's the thing with Ubisoft. They have a lot of potential that they're yes. never gonna capitalize on so and that's the problem yes so bringing them under polaris yeah rayman's coming back and trust me i have i'm not even there yet the best i'm saving the best for last um, okay I'm i will elaborate on some of this stuff but yeah yes. assassin's creed far cry splinter cell that's coming back under ubisoft and we're getting the rayman ip for um thank god about time yeah that's i will elaborate on so all right that's my eighth pick ubisoft montreal Good stuff. And Tony, your eighth pick. All right. My number eight pick is Spike Chunsoft, baby. <laughs> okay. Spike now, Chunsoft. they, you may be, some of you may be wondering, what games have they made? Well, That's I mean. counter you with a better question. What games haven't they made? They've made the, uh, the Danganronpa trilogy, Shirin the Wanderer. Um, they have a lot. It says oh. only the fourth one, but those games are like like roguelike fantasy type things. Uh, they made the Zero Escape trilogy, Attack on Titan on the 3DS, uh, Fitness Circuit, Zanky Zero, which I've heard of. Never I the Somnium Files. So they're known, and then uh, some people that have worked for them have split off into their own. Uh, studio as well and I played one of their games recently so they're known for stories that blow your freaking mind like just have a lot of twists a lot of tension a lot of suspense uh, the D- D- Rampa games I'm playing through now uh, I just recently beat one and it was a little it didn't hit me as much as I wanted it to but the story just never let up I was always on edge um uh, their visual novel 
games, but they have like a investigation segment where you can like walk around the school that you're trapped in and like investigate stuff, you know, like find clues for your cases. And then there are these things called class trials, which is like when somebody kills somebody else, they get put on trial and you have to like essentially like plead like why they're the ones that did it. And they try and say they didn't. And there's this interesting mechanic where like it turns into like a rail shooter. And then, like, you have to, like, it shows all of the words that the people are saying about, like, various things. And then you have to find, essentially, like, the weak link in the argument, and then you shoot it. <clears throat> and then you, and then, like, the main character will be like, no, that's wrong. And then, like, they'll say, actually, this is what happened. And then he'll present the clues. So, like... I've never seen a studio do such creative things with visual novels. And I would want to take that even further, like maybe create like a game, like a visual novel type game, like persona that has like regular fighting sections. And like you, you would like, like the main characters would have weapons made out of their words. So like a sword that's like, you know, whatever, like something like that. And then it'd be basically like, a battle of words, like literally, and then yeah. that would train, you know, like do keep the mystery vibe going, um, do something like that. Um, yeah, the sky's the limit with them because they just c- continue to blow my mind. And I mean, there's a reason they're one of the more popular Japanese v- video game developers. So I would love to work with them and just blow people's brains. Yeah, you could argue that. Um, Phoenix Wright has a very similar style, especially with the whole trial system. Um, a lot of the games were originally for DS, and there are mechanics that are in vain to, you know, exploiting someone's lies and showing, you know, what actually ended up happening. But with, you know, Danganronpa, I think they're the more fleshed out version in the sense of like visual novel presentation, since that's the one most people see as being the flashiest and the most, you know, standout-ish versus, you know, the one that's basically just court simulator. Yeah. I like it. That's a good pick. That's they they cover a lot. You get a lot with them. Oh yeah. Um great pick. So that was eight. All right. We're getting uh getting down there. So Andy, give me your ninth pick. All right. Ninth pick is, you know, yet another obscure company. This one is called Vlambeer, and they've done a few, you know, they've done some things. One of, they've done a serious Sam Indie series. Um, this is kind of just like a, like an action, you know, turn-based RPG game. Nothing too crazy, but the two big ones under this, you know, IP, I guess the company one of them is called luft rousers and it's a arcade pixel style you know i guess aerial to naval war combat game and then the other one that i'm more biased towards is nuclear throne and that's like the post-apocalyptic roguelite with you know emphasis on guns and you, you know chaotic explosions going on everywhere um one thing I like about this is this one's a little bit more this one's got a little bit of everything. So it picks up on the popular IP, Serious Sam doing its own thing with that. It's got like a nice arcade style gameplay, you know, something for more nostalgic people in that regard. And then Nuclear Throne, it's a you know pixelated roguelite and definitely got a nice niche audience. Kind that of is interesting. It. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, my studio will kind of just just give itself, like I said before, core games that people will kind of go back to every so often, but kind of dipping itself in the pool of stuff that people would recognize, stuff that would catch someone's attention, and maybe just that off game that you wouldn't bother picking up initially, but once you do, you're immediately hooked on it. I like their logo a lot. Yeah, it's interesting. And it's it's really simple. It's literally just a bear on fire. And it fits better with Nuclear Throne, but it's definitely neat just to see 
just some creative take on something that isn't just words or some random logo, just something more personalized. I like it. That is a great, uh, that's a great indie pick because that's a Dutch studio. Mm -hmm. Very small team. Oh that's, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. All right. Moving on to my ninth pick. Yeah. I'm really excited about this one. Okay. Double fine productions. Okay. That's actually very broad for what they offer. Exactly. Um, I'm thinking obviously psychonauts. Okay. Psychonauts is the big one. Um, I got to have double fine in my publisher because of, you know, I have, let me just go through my list. I have insomniac. I have sucker punch. I have team yep. Sonic, you know, double fine productions goes along with that. Um, third person action platformer. Uh, they also have rad, which was a decent game. Mm. Um, you know, so having, having that talent on board, I think psychonauts would fit, um, fit fine and if they wanted to make an, any kind of new ip they have that talent i love the art style and, and the direction of their game specifically like uh think of grim fandango okay love that absolutely you know so much style in that um day of the tentacles you know a lot of style on that so i think that's just an, a team where you can't go wrong and it 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 brings a lot of um diversity and not diver not just diversity but a lot of creativity um to the publisher specifically with double fine yeah there's a couple other ones i've heard of that double fine have done i know this one's a little bit more you know obscure but have you ever heard of the game hack and slash no okay so this is just like a very 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 see minor here okay yeah very minor game done by double fine the game itself is about yeah. exploring programming, but done in like a Legend of Zelda style. Basically, the main character gets a sword, breaks off into like this thumb drive thing, and then it takes the concept of you know programming and it loses terms and changes the game's meta, like almost like uh, Bob is you, but just a little bit more introductory in its approach. I know Double Fine's such an interesting company. I, yeah, the they're, I think they would just, they would just bring a sense of like, oh wow, let's see what they're capable of. Let's see what they're about to create. Um, same, you know, with Kojima Productions or um, a Ghost Story Games, it's like, wow, they're they're wacky. They they are very creative. Um, it just, you never know what you're gonna get. But then again. You know, I'm bringing them on because of their specific style. It's it's style very different from a hyper realistic um, approach. Uh, like a lot of these that I have um, are bringing now. I see a lot of you know, like Insomniacs moving to more realistic. Sucker Punch is moving to more realistic. Yeah. Um, Kojima's realistic. You know, almost all of the ones I have are like that. So I'm hoping that um, with this one and then my next one, I can bring that uh, more. Um, stylized approach and, and creative approach to the publisher, yeah, especially definitely. with the IP I'm acquiring. So, yep. All right, that will be uh, ninth. So, Tony, your ninth pick. All right, my ninth pick. Um, now this is probably the most mainstream one I'm going to pick. Um, hopefully, I'm not stealing anybody's. My number nine is Naughty Dog. Ooh, that's a solid one. Now, I mean, the, the, the Uncharted games, classics, except for the first one. That one kind of plays like ass. Um, but all the other ones are great, man. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Last of Us 1, awesome. Last of Us 2, in my opinion, masterpiece. Oh, shut up. I don't care. Okay. I don't want to hear I'm, your I'm opinion. Gonna... It doesn't okay. matter. Um, la, 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 la. No, um, I'm going to frown, but you won't see it. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, here's the thing about Naughty Dog games that I love is that they f somehow find a way to make, you know, these like big bombastic games. I mean, have you seen the graphics of some of them? Uncharted oh, 4, yeah. Last of Insane. Us 2. Damn. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. You know, so they they spare no expense, but 
they're somehow still story driven like the the you know like in uh in last of us yeah there's the element of like you know you can explore you know like certain buildings and find resources and stuff and find notes that people write and there's things like that there's crafting but somehow none of that ever felt tedious Mm -hmm. To me, like, I wanted to know, like, if I found a safe, I wanted to find the combination. I wanted to read the notes. Yeah, I wanted true. to do all that stuff, you know, and I haven't felt that with many of those kind of games, you know, especially the crafting, because crafting's one of those things that's easy to mess up. But in Last of Us, it's it's just so accessible. It's just so user-friendly. So I would want to do uh, something you know, in their, like, grounded style, but, like, make it, like, a fantasy RPG. So, like, okay. you, you know, like, take that, you know, like, skill trees, classes, all that stuff, magic. It'd be an RPG, but it would be in that style. So, I guess... There's a theory that that's going to be their next game, that the one they're working on now. Oh, uh, like, dude. Ah. Uh, yeah, I hope so. Like, imagine... It occurred to me when I saw the trailer for Final Fantasy sixteen. like, imagine, like a mage firing magic but instead of you know it being the traditional way it's like you it's essentially like a th third person shooter you yeah. know imagine mm -hmm. like imagine like fighting as like a a knight with a sword or like a barbarian or dwarf with an axe that has that hard hitting grittiness that melee combat had in the last of us when you're smacking dudes and infected with a pipe or a freaking two by four like you know just bring those two worlds together and you know just create an experience i mean some people be like well that's just the new god of war which you know <laughs> fine but i think you could do enough stuff to differentiate it from that at least a little bit and it would give me a possible opportunity to work with neil Druckmann. at which point uh, my life would have peaked, and um, I could just die happy. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Can I barter you for IP? <laughs> I'll give you Hyperscape for Jack and Daxter. Mm. <laughs> Hyperscape. Exactly. Let's, let's see what that is. Exactly. Um, exactly. I would have. <laughs> I would have. <laughs> I would have loved to pick Naughty Dog. I really just want the um, Jack IP, though. And essentially, I mean. I guess I wouldn't. It, I, I'm get just the looking crash at IP, images but. from this, and it looks kind of cool. You could do some stuff with it. All okay, right. you know what? I accept your barter. Mm. Yes. All right. <laughs> I get See, the Jack this IP. Is another collaboration <laughs> going along. Yes. All right. We're collabing with that. All right, Andy, give me your final pick. Final pick. All right. This was, you know, my whole theme for the most part has been core gameplay. You know, loosely saying stuff like, you know, Riot Games, I went with uh, Team Cherry, that kind of sort. Number 10, to round it off, is Jagex. What? How do you spell that? <laughs> G, oh, I'm sorry, it's um, J-A-G-E-X. The big thing, okay. you know, this is the RuneScape company. Oh, uh, okay, okay. Yes. Okay. I mean, this is kind of another cult classic in its own right. It's partially rose-tinted glasses, minded, but the game is so grindy. The game has so much to do that people, to this day, still play it. Now, granted, it's not going to hit, you know, top 100 anytime soon but the people that are invested in it are still invested in it like it has a solid foundation of consistent players you know that's lasted the the duration of its you know market time 21 years yeah plus yeah. so between the old series and then when they remade the engine modern day but yeah this is a big one i really want to have and i kind of saved it for last that's a hit yeah that's a hit i, I don't think anyone's gonna take it but i just wanted to solidify that i love the concept of investing into 
such a popular, well, maybe not popular per se, but just a very critically successful game. Maybe the IP isn't so much there, but having people constantly, you know, make their way back to it. They might take a break for a couple of months, but at the end of the day, they're going to, you know, crawl back to it in some shape or form. Um, I think that's a great way to round out your um, publisher focused on gameplay. Mm. Um, we can talk about it here. Uh, we can talk about our publishers here as soon as we're finished with our picks. Yeah. Now, my last pick is uh, similar to yours in that it's going to round out what my oh, publisher is going. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, never mind. It's opposite. <laughs> um, and it, it's, a, it's a studio called Platonic. Okay. Sounds familiar. Uh, Platonic uh, created um, Ukulele. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's why. Ukulele and the Impossible Lair. Um, just recently, they made a little gator game. They co-developed uh, BPM. Okay, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I might have seen that at some point. Now, did they do the original Ukulele or just the the second one? No, uh, they did both. Okay, cool. Ukulele was their first game because yes. this is a reason. This is the reason I wanted Platonic. These are the original developers from Rareware from the yes. N64 days. If, absolutely, yep. That's their spiritual successor, so to speak. Yes. So I'm I'm getting the talent that made Banjo Kazooie. There you go. That's a good way of looking at it. So with the IP I've acquired, I'm giving Platonic Sly Cooper. Mm -hmm. I'm giving Platonic now Jack because I bartered for that IP. <laughs> You're like bartering, <laughs> basically becoming a monopoly of IPs. Like if it's known, you're just going to own it. <laughs> Rayman. Play imagine Platonic creating a Rayman game. Like Ukulele wasn't the greatest game, mostly because of the, um, the world and level design. Mm -hmm. But mechanics... Um, you know the art style everything like that was was great so we give them an ip with some design and some direction i think this is the team that's going to make uh bring back the uh 3d platformer so i would i would give platonic sly cooper i would give them um any of the the mascot platformers so when are we going to get our rayman kojima game or i could give kojima rayman and he could be uh, unlockable <laughs> in Death Stranding too. Basically, like a de a decapitated body, like dismemberment. But instead, of, instead of a BB, it's a Rayman. <laughs> yeah, our man. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love it. So Platonic uh, definitely. Topic. Yeah, Platonic rounds it out because imagine they have the talent of Double Fine, they have the talent of Insomniac and Sucker Punch there to help. Um, uh huh. So uh, mine obviously consists of. Narrative games. You got the uh, third person platformer um, narrative games, and then you got the first person narrative games in there. Uh, but that's mostly what I'm focusing on. And then, of course, I had to add like Kojima and Bungie. I mean, come on. Sure, Kojima. Yeah. I mean, side note, uh, kind of a reason why I said Rayman Kojima um, and Death Stranding, a lot of the supporting side characters just have like some sort of noun or whatever and then man at the end you know you have dead man die hard that's man, true die hard man, man. Yeah. so ray man would have been like the extension of like the death stranding universe so to speak perfect <laughs> perfect perfect um <laughs> all right real quick um i'll give my um honorable mentions because i wanted to bring back pandemic okay uh, that was a studio I was going to bring, uh, put in my, uh, publisher pandemic. And then, um, also I think haze light studios would have fit perfectly, but I think Joseph Ferris being independent, I'm fine with that. I'll allow yeah. it. Um, but those are really my honorable mentions. The only other one I would want is, um, IDOS Montreal, but I am happy with, I'm happy with my publisher. So I think I have yeah. a good, good list here. Yeah, and briefly, I didn't get to go over my honorable mentions, but they're not too crazy. Um, I would have picked Square Enix, Kingdom Hearts series is, you know, definitely solid gameplay throughout the years. And then, honestly, another one I would have thrown in there would have been uh, Humble Bundle Games, if you've ever oh, like, okay. heard. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, they did Slay the Spire. Yeah. Um, I can't think of any other immediate ones, but Humble Bundle kind of has a genre of games 
that you wouldn't really expect to be good, but when you play them, actually catch you off guard. Yeah, so, um, you know, we talked a lot about, Tony, I'm getting to you, I'm saving you for last. So we talked a little bit about um, our publishers, um, and we went through kind of why we wanted each team as we were going through. So I don't think we need to have a, um, you know, huge explanation of, of why we did it, because we kind of went through as as we picked them, which I liked. Yeah. So, Andy, uh, you and I, uh, we talked about our honorable mentions and kind of the ideas of our publishers. So we're saving the best for last, Tony. Of course. I want to hear exactly what your 10th pick is going to be, because you... You got the last one, so you could pick anything right now. Right. Give me your 10th pick and um, your honorable mentions, and then we'll end it from there. All right. Well, I'm going to give my honorable mentions first. Uh, okay. There aren't, a f- there aren't a lot, but uh, I would love to do something with uh, Capcom. Okay. You know, okay. I, I, yeah. Look, like I said with the uh, t- Team Reptile pick, I primarily like to play like, like you know like really story driven games that impact me and make me think, but sometimes I just like to play a, a Resident Evil or a Devil May Cry game. You know, just sure. something fun, stylish, yeah. beautiful graphics. So I I don't know what kind of game I'd make with them exactly, but it would you know be. Well, sometimes the Capcom games they get a little crazy. I know. Dead Rising, you know, which is kind of like, whoa, that's a bit out there. So yeah. that might fit your. It'd probably you be know, team. some kind of like horror survival, maybe like zombie action, you know, just like a hodgepodge of a few different things that I love that they do really well. Yeah, Capcom um, kind of does that too, so that works. Yeah, my other, a great pick. My other honorable mention um, is Rockstar. Ooh, I'm now, surprised nobody picked that. Yeah. Now, mainly. I've never actually beaten a Grand Theft Auto game. I would just play them and, you know, like, r- run over people, steal a chopper, and then get shot <laughs> That's the only out of the play. sky by He's the military. The That's all yeah, it is. Exactly. Like, yeah. you know, like, their sandboxes are impressive, you know, with, like, the day-night cycle, how the weather mm-hmm. changes, just driving around, listening to music, and b- oh, yeah. b- b- Bully is really their game that I played the hell out of when I was younger. Of course. That game, Interesting. That's one of the few open world sandbox games that I loved. I love doing all the side stuff. I love driving to the carnival and just playing games and winning prizes. All that stuff just was so much fun. I would actually make a new one of those and then I'd make a sandbox game that's about like it's like Grand Theft Auto but with like young adults or teenagers were like you know like you you have these rival gangs or something and it's like it takes place in like in a in a city you know like the grand theft autos but it'd be more intimate a little bit like there would still be those elements but it wouldn't be as bombastic you know we'll go, we'll go with the division for that just kidding <laughs> and then my final honorable mention i want to partner with ea and be like look You've made so many games that I loved as a kid. Harry Potter, Prisoner of Azkaban, Harry Potter Chamber of Secrets. I think they published or worked on uh, Mass Effect and all that stuff. Yeah. Like, they've done great stuff. And yeah. I don't know what they're doing now. I think they've lost their souls. So I would be yes. the one to show them the light again. And That's what I was thinking with Ubisoft. Yeah, exactly. Uh, see, you both are going into microtransactions. I don't think I could collab with you guys anymore. I, my NFTs. Is, we need NFTs. You know, <laughs> yeah. Listen, if you, if you buy it once, you can buy it again. NFT hedgehogs. Oh, God. <laughs> Let's make right, it happen. You, what's okay. your 10th pick? All right. All right. My 10th pick is the one I'm most passionate about, which is why it's last, obviously. Uh, I'm picking Dramatic Labs. Now, okay. this is a studio that is made from people who were working for Telltale before oh. they closed. And they're working on the Expanse game, which is a companion to the show that I haven't seen. Uh, okay. And Telltale Star Trek, which I'm not a Star Trek fan. I, I love the JJ movies and I like Beyond. It was okay. Um,. But man, I am excited to see a new Telltale game that looks polished. It looks like they're in their element better than ever. Um, I'm just going to jump in real quick. All right. On their website, <laughs> just for you, it says, we're hiring. There you go. And I want to read this um, 
last sentence here in in their um in their <laughs> summary bio thing. Using Epic's Unreal Engine and Beanie, our propri- proprietary n- uh, narrative engine, we are exploring new formats, game mechanics, storytelling techniques, and pushing the boundaries of dynamic, playable stories. So that's right up your alley. Oh my mm-hmm. god. I'm still waiting for them <laughs> to eventually open source their Telltale Engine. If they do that. That means that's down a, the road, but yeah. Imagine oh, yeah, the, yeah. the IPs that people would use exactly. just using that engine. All right, so my the projects I'd want to make with them, um, I know with the Naughty Dog pick, I mentioned like a more grounded RPG type of thing. So mm-hmm. the one that I would jump to is one I've had in my head for a while, which should be like essentially like a RPG, but it would center around like player choice and the narrative would change. So like say <clears throat> like at, at a point, you know, like one of your party members gets like badly hurt. And it's like, okay, are you going to have your mage use some magic to heal them, which would leave them with less magic for an encounter later? Or are you going to craft, like, a healing item? But then now you have less resources. You know, like, it'd be fun to, like, talk to different players and be like, how many party members did you make it to the end with? Did any of your party members leave because you pissed them off? Uh, Oh, I can't wait for the mobile ad clickbait. (laughs) <laughs> did you um spare the villain or did you choose to kill them you know stuff like that i think that'd be an interesting twist on the genre but i mean the telltale games are basically interactive shows yeah you know which is what i love about them so i would even be fine with just having like a big epic story you know like a like a properly long game but in that style so it's just like them doing what they do best, what they have done best, but just on a larger scale. Um, but yeah, to work with them, like if I could pick one studio, I'm sorry, Neil, but I got to pick the people that uh, gave me my first video game child in Clementine from Walking Dead. Uh, yeah. The, yeah. I still think about those games. V- pretty much like multiple times a day they just they impacted me in a way few pieces of media in general have and i think you know to work with them would not only be a good opportunity to tell stories i'd want to tell but just to learn from them how they do what they do and you know like create some of my own games from my studio that we make in-house and you know pick learn from the best of the best of the best, the ones that I love and, you know, just continue to innovate in ways that they have. Yeah. I mean, we better watch out. Clint, you know, Caleb might try to steal some IPs over there. <laughs> Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm on the hunt for IPs. No, but this was just a fun exercise just to talk about um, game studios. And I'm sitting here adding it up. We've talked about close to 40 game studios, probably about 35 to 40 game yeah, 30 studios. Plus, no, at the very minimum. At the very minimum. Yeah. So, um, you know, we've been going, um, a while and we, we kind of gave our, our publishers, you know, the, um, idea of what we're wanting to accomplish, what our public, with our publishers and, um, acquiring the studios we've acquired. We talked a lot about, um, some, some developers and I'm sh- we've all heard developers that we've never heard of before. And, um, we've had some interesting, you know, <laughs> analysis on, um, some of these, with uh you know um rayman for kojima productions yeah that, I mean, that's perfect it's, the possibilities are there though like when you collect a bunch of these ips and different companies the those possibilities are there if you want to venture down that route yes now this exercise we could um we could go on and elaborate forever on this but what we'll do is we could actually have another episode where we um, do some kind of exercise with developers or even games or game genres maybe yeah um like that but yeah i, I like um i like what we did i think dramatic labs is a great pick I'm, i was on their uh site um you know they only have the two games because they're a spinoff but um that's a great great formula they have i think that fits for the weirdo uh publisher <laughs> <laughs> publishing i love it that's that's what I have to say about our exercise. So, Andy, give me your final thoughts, and then, uh, Tony, we'll end with you. Yeah, I mean, overall, 
I liked how each of us took a theme, even though they're you know each different publisher handled things differently. You could kind of rope them back together into its theme. Like I said before, mine is core gameplay. Um, Caleb in particular is into narrative and Tony kind of likes to hit those niche, we want to call it those like check boxes, so to speak. And when they work, they work really well. So hearing each of us kind of explain the whys behind our decisions really kind of opens up to possibilities regarding those venues down the road. Yeah, which is uh, something we can do in the future is exercise that. Yeah. All right. Um, and then Tony, Mr. Uh, man, you got, what could I, what could I call you? I'm going to, I'm going to call you. Um, <laughs> um, what's the guy's name? Uh, not, not Clementine, the other guy. Uh, Lee. Uh, Lee? Lee Everett. Yeah, all right, Mr. Uh, Lee Everett. <laughs> end this, end this, uh, end the episode. It was really interesting to see, like, like I feel like now I have an idea of, like, what makes the three of us uh, tick <laughs> when it comes to, like, the kind of games we like to play. It was fun to see how much uh, overlap there was. Like, I thought I would, you know, be here and be, like, like both of you would be picking, like, high-profile studios, and I'd be like, uh, I want to work with the studio that's made these two visual novels. But no, it was more like Andy picked a lot of indie studios. And then uh, even Caleb, he likes the more popular stuff, but he still likes story. And it's not just like, I just want to make like a brainless, you know, hack and slash or a shooter. Yeah. Like, there was yeah, still I a, mean, I'm the black sheep of the group, it. so I'm allowed to make this type of <laughs> decisions. Yeah, and then uh, the last thing I'll say is that um, I'm kind of bummed that there's a slim chance I'll be able to make any of these games. But I mean, it but was there's a chance. Also, like yeah. never zero. Remember that it was like a great. I'm not, you know, gonna be like ultra spiritual, but like I do believe there's merit to like, like internalizing like what you want to accomplish in life, and then like seeing it as reality in your mind just to be brave enough to you know pursue it so i mean i could very well end up doing at least one of these projects and if even if i just do one i'll feel like i'd have really made it and i'd feel really proud of myself so so thank you um both for coming on andy and uh tony yeah absolutely always a yeah, pleasure. fun exercise um <clears throat> interesting seeing our different um uh, ideologies behind um things that have games that have impacted us so sure yep fun exercise and you know i'll have you both on for another exercise sometimes so till then thank you both for coming on and we will see